Welcome, and thank you for coming to the presentation, Critical Intersections, Pedagogy, Technology, and Student Learning. I'm also from Brooklyn, so I'll try to slow down my speech. <laughs> Let me tell you a little bit about Medgar Evers College. Medgar Evers College is a traditional urban institution. It is located in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. It is a historically predominantly black institution. 80% of our students are black. What does that mean? African American, black from the Caribbean, Africa, and the Middle East, okay? We have a large Latino population. Our Latino population is about 10 to 12%, okay? Another important fact to know about Medgar Evers College is 60% of our students are first generation collegians. They're the first ones in their family to attend college. And over 87% of them receive financial aid, okay? Our campus is um, approximately 7,000 students. We are a comprehensive undergraduate college. So we have associate's degrees and um, baccalaureate degrees. Actually, currently, I'm working on our first graduate degree. We are part of a larger system called CUNY, City University of New York. That's 24 institutions. So that's giving you a little bit of background. By the way, you can ask questions anytime during the presentation. I love conversation. Soy cubana, así que me encanta la conversación. Bueno, I'm going to begin with two stories because this is how my journey started with this idea of we have to rethink pedagogy in higher education to really think about student learning and what I call the pedagogy of technology, okay? So the first story, Jacob's Shell. I was babysitting a friend of mine's grandson and he was four years old. It was a little bit ago. I'm not going to tell you how old he is now, but it was a little bit ago. And I love shells. I love the ocean. I love collecting shells. So he was sitting in an area, and I had this big conch shell. I said, you know, Jacob, do you know that you can hear the ocean if you put the shell against your ear? And he was mesmerized by this. So he puts the shell on his ear, and I said, can you hear it? He goes, and he was listening, then he goes, how do you turn it off? <laughs> okay? So I said, wow, okay, interesting. In his, in his mind, everything is, is electronic. You can turn it on or turn it off. The other interesting thing was women's volleyball team. I was part of an institution, a Division I institution at the time, and I was teaching an honors class because I'm an administrator, but I teach to keep my sanity and to be able to keep being an administrator. I'm an associate provost, assistant vice president. So I was teaching a social science research class. And we were talking about some sort of event or something. And I had a lot of, in this particular class, a lot of the young women that were in our female soccer team. And at one point I said, well, did you see? Yeah, yeah, we were watching something. I forgot what it was. And we were talking about it. And I said, oh, really? How were you talking about it? And what was said? Well, we don't know what everybody said in the conversation. And I said, what do you mean? You, were you in the same room having? Yeah. So how don't you know what you were all saying? Well, we were texting each other. I said, so you were all in the same room, watching the same thing, but you weren't talking to each other. You were texting each other. And they're like, yeah. And I said, wow. This to me was, you know, when you say moments where you have an epiphany and you say, you know what? Students and children do not receive information from the world the way that I received it. When we were in a room, we spoke to each other. All right? We talked to each other. You know, we, don't, we didn't text each other when we were in the same room. You know, when I grew up, you know, there, a shell was a shell you found in the ocean. There was no turning it off. It was not connected to anything. 
So that started my thinking. And then, and this bridges both my previous institution and my work at Medgar Evers, I was asking people not their chronological age, but their technological age, okay? Specifically faculty. And this is very telling because for a generation that would rather text each other in a room than speak to each other, your technological age is very important. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask for a show of hands here, okay? Who still reads a newspaper, listens to the radio, and watches TV to get news? Raise your hand. Okay, 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 all right. So your technological age is a little bit better, all right. Who watches cable? Okay. All right. Who uses PowerPoint um, presentations online? Okay. All right. Provides tests online? Okay. Just uses the cell phone to call and text? All right. By the way, students don't read the newspaper. You know that. They get, they get alerts. But they filter their alerts. They don't get alerts about everything. They filter what they get news from. And I mean, I subscribe to Huffington Post as well. But, and I also filter my alerts. But I found when I gave this test to many faculty, guess what? They still read the newspaper, still watch cable. Students don't watch cable. They live stream. Everything is live stream. Hulu, right? So I began to see that there was a real disconnect in the way we teach to the way students learn. And I have to tell you, at Medgarvis College, when I first came, there was no online degree. Mostly hybrid courses. Again, in, institutionally, it was a traditional urban brick and mortars institution. Now, what might impact that, you think? Well, it's undergraduate. It's minority students. It's first generation collegians, students with developmental um, learning needs. So faculty wanted to shy away from technology because of all the obvious reasons. But still, this is the 21st century technology that you all are aware of participating in video conferences, obtain um, news from social media, creates own videos, post videos. Every student of mine at Medgar Evers has an Instagram account. When I asked faculty how many people had Instagram accounts, no one, okay, no one. I even asked them if they tweeted. They couldn't even say the word tweet. That, that what thing? That, no, no, I don't do that thing with the bird. Okay? Okay? So even the faculty that were using Blackboard, okay, was using Blackboard in just posting materials. Okay? Posting materials. Okay? Even the blended courses when I first came to Medgar three years ago were interesting to say the least. Okay? So I said to myself, we really have to move away from this. Um, not that, quite frankly, we're ready completely to go online. Because quite frankly, you know, I, even though I've taught on completely, um, in completely online institutions and, and taught blended courses and face-to-face -face courses, I think for the population that I deal with, we are at this point, and with the faculty that have best serving students in a blended environment, okay? But the reality is that blended environment has to be more technologically rich. And more technologically rich in a pedagogical and grounded in pedagogy, okay? But again, most of my faculty see it this way. I'm gonna read the cartoon to you because you're, you're not gonna necessarily see it. I just updated my Facebook, my MySpace, Twitter, 
texted a homework reminder to you, Google the answer to the last night's bonus assignment, and now I'm uploading. Oops, gotta go. My teacher is coming, my phone is supposed to be off, and in my locker. Maybe someday the school will provide us with the technology that is already in our pockets. I still have faculty in Medgar Evers College today that when they see their students with the cell phone, are like, put your cell phone away. Put your iPad away. And again, not understanding the power of how students learn and the incorporation of that mobile technology in their learning, okay? Now granted, Medgar Evers has a faculty that I would say 80%, 85% are tenured, and they were tenured more than 10 years ago, okay? So that's part of the issue, that's part of the issue, okay? I can see somebody like the cartoon, they took a picture of it on their cell phone. <laughs> they think of it as disruptive technology. They think that technology disrupts the thinking, the understanding of a subject. And I'm gonna use a quote from Pew. What we're labeling as distraction, some see as a failure of adults to see how these kids process information. They're not saying distraction is good, but but the label distraction is a judgment of the generation, okay? Students today live in a distracted society. They're constantly getting bombarded with information. I think as educators, we have to see now how to create a dialogue in the noise, that not to make it disruptive, but to make it a narrative of learning because a lot is coming towards the student. And I think our job at this point is to create a learning environment that takes that disruption and in essence creates a dialogue of learning. The disruption is not gonna go away. The question is how do we as educators develop pedagogy to incorporate that dis dis disruption into a stream of learning, okay? So here are some things. So it's funny, the question was, you know, why did a social scientist and a lapsed biologist keep, become interested in teaching with technology? Because I brought a colleague of mine who was in his 70s, and he's, he's a dean and a biologist, that's why the lapsed biologist and I'm a social scientist. One of the things that we found also, with this technology, as going back to my soccer girls, was there was a breaking down of community and communication. And we talk about building student engagement on campus. Well, in the digital age, how do you build community? Well, for me, one solution was to create a digital community. Because students are doing it already. So you create a digital online community. But you create one that, I'm a constructivist, so I believe students should construct their own knowledge. We're never going to teach students things. What we're going to do is, I believe, if we're effective in our education, is to provide the environment for their learning. Very John Dewey, you know, very Piaget, but that's what I believe. And how can we use this to improve learning? So I looked at this model called College Readiness and Academic Engagement. And this really was the philosophical framework for what I did to create the online community, okay? What were key cognitive strategies, the key content, academic behaviors that I wanted students to model online, and ultimately contextual skills and awareness, okay? In essence, creating experiential learning online, all right? Because you certainly couldn't take them outside of their computers and outside of their mobile phone. And again, the constructivist. It's an approach to learning where you create an environment that students are themselves creating the knowledge, okay? 
I always think of, you know, Spanish was my first language. And I think of how we teach students language even today and why it's a problem. We teach language in a very artificial environment still. You know, you still have language classes saying, you know, this is a pencil, say pencil in Spanish, say pencil in French. When we were learning language, when we were acquiring language, as Jim Cummins says, we didn't, we didn't do that. Your mother said, tomate la leche, trae la leche. It was in a context. You learn language to create meaning, not disembodied language. And this is very similar to technology and learning, okay? So the digital experiential learning had these elements in it. Provide students with an experience to construct their own knowledge, provide experience in and of appreciation from multiple perspectives. This is very important. My opinion, grounded in, grounded in whatever the assignment is, by the way, not just my free-floating opinion, um, is very important. Embedded learning in realistic and re relevant context. You know, statistics show us that minority students go in at very healthy rates to be STEM majors, but they fall apart after the first year. They literally leave the STEM field, okay? And it's usually through gateway courses, but in many instances, when I've done focus group with, with um, minority students of why they left, why they left being a nursing major, a, a pharmacy major, pre-pharmacy. They didn't understand how the courses they were taking connected to the goal of their profession. They didn't understand why they had to take calculus, all right? They didn't understand why a pharmacist has to learn how to write, okay? Or, you know, literally questions. So they didn't connect their learning to real world. The other is encourage ownership and voice in learning. Our whole lives long, learning for us has been very passive. How many of you remember going to school and the teacher is lecturing at you? And what did you do? You took notes. And then at the test, what did you do? You regurgitated that information. There was very little asked of you as a person you know, to include yourself in that learning, right? It was basically, what, is, what do I have to learn? How do I have to translate it so that the professor will give me the grade that I need to have, okay? Again, in a digital environment, we have the opportunity for students to encourage the ownership of their, to take responsibility for their learning and to create an academic voice to really create an academic voice, okay? Not be passive. To create a social experience, dig a digital social experience, okay? And I'll show you how we did that, all right? Finally, to include the use of multiple modes of representation. What does that mean? Boy, I saw this video that will answer the question, let me include it in my answer. It's no longer words, but it's weaving the images and the text to address whatever the question is that's being asked of the student. So again, that feeds into them personalizing their learning experience, them bringing things to the learning experiences. The other is it encourages self-awareness in the knowledge and construction process. We never ask students to think about how they learn, to reflect about their learning. We just expect them to learn and give us the information, okay? So I received a fairly generous grant to do this, Project Quest, um, 1.5, I think it was $1.3 million. And one of the things that I saw, 
specifically with STEM minority STEM students is they didn't understand how to read scientific text. They did not understand. You know why? They had never been taught to read scientific text. Because really, any engagement with text was Don Quixote, you know, Jane Eyre, William Shakespeare. It was basically narrative text. Now, any of my colleagues in the sciences will tell you that every scientific textbook to this day is based on a Harvard outline, okay? If you look at a scientific textbook, every chapter is a Harvard outline. What is the, the large topic? What are the subtopics? What are the elements in each subtopic? And I could see my students really struggling in the sciences. How did I know they were struggling? Because I would open their textbook and everything would be highlighted. It was like a bloodbath of yellow, green, pink, and blue. Right? Everything was important. All right. And they would say to me, I'm studying. I don't understand why I'm not doing well in the test. I'm reading everything. And I'm like, you're really reading everything in a chemistry text? You. They didn't know how to even approach the material. So we created these digital seminars, OK, that students, and it was literally a digital seminar in scientific reading, writing, and thinking. Okay, and the carrot to the student was that they would get three free credits if they attended, and this started in a private institution. So three free credits basically was close to $4,000. So it wasn't a small thing. They had to participate in these seminars, and they were digital seminars, didn't matter what major you were, biology, chemistry, physics, mathematics. The obligation was the following, that you had to sign up for the seminar, OK? You had to participate every week in the seminar. And every week, there was a different topic. And I worked with my faculty in math, biology, chemistry, and physics to create the topics for the seminar, OK? So TED Talks are a beautiful thing. TED Talks are a beautiful thing. So for example, one topic would be, we picked my stroke of insight. This is a neurologist who wrote a book on her own stroke and what she physically, psychologically, and mentally went through while she was experiencing the stroke and her recovery. She's a neurologist from Harvard. If you ever get a chance, read the book. The book is fascinating, OK? So what we did was the assignment for the week in the seminar Oh, by the way, back up. To be part of the seminar, every student had to write a profile. You had to develop your own profile. And you had to answer three questions in the profile. And you could design it any way you wanted. The first question is, where did you come from? The second question is, who are you now? The third question is, where do you want to be in five years? OK? So already, the seminar engaged them on a very personal level. And the instructors commented on these profiles. And the instructors were asked to do profiles as well. OK? That first week, there were so many hits, the students were dying to see who was on. And they were allowed, by the way, in their profiles to include mini videos. I had one person that was a, a rapper. So he included in his profile, is who he is now, a mini digital rapping video. OK? So then one topic was this particular 
my stroke of insight. We wanted to get different types of scientific reading, okay? So they had to view the video, which if you know TED Talks, it's 19 minutes. Then they had to read two sections of this book. And then they had to answer two prompts. The prompts were very purposeful to the learner. One prompt was about the content. The other prompt was about the type of content. So this was a personal narrative, but very science heavy, okay? So they had to answer the prompts. They couldn't say, gee, I liked the video. So we gave them guidelines on an academic blog because they were literally blogging academically. So we gave them a rubric for the academic blog. They could only answer the prompt by citing elements of the TED Talk or elements of the reading. The other important thing was, that wasn't the end of it. You were required to comment on two other colleagues' blogs. You were required to comment on two other colleagues' blogs. Why? That was the fun. The first week, and you couldn't say, gee, I liked what Jose did. I, you know, I liked what he wrote. Oh no, I didn't like what, no. You basically had to comment on the prompt based on the person's answering of the prompt, and if you agreed with it, why you agreed with it, and evidence. If you disagreed with it, evidence to why you disagreed with it, or brought in another perspective. I have to tell you, the first week, everybody did what was baseline required. In the second and third week, something very interesting happened. We were not the leaders of the conversation anymore. After the first two blogs, they started now commenting on each other. Then, even if you didn't comment on a particular blog, you were reading it, and then you were commenting on it. And it wasn't the I like it or dislike it. That is where the true construction of knowledge started to happen. Because students were then really, really engaged in the material, understanding the material, and developing a personal academic stand on the content, okay? I'm getting goosebumps, I get so excited about this. Another was a historical scientific article. There's a great article in Scientific America called the Galileo Affair. It is a historical research article and it talks about Galileo and specifically scientific methodology and hypothesis testing, which students do not understand. They don't understand it, okay? So we had them read this article, okay? But then we also had them look at different information to get them interested in Galileo and that how the church basically almost um, killed him, all right? to get them interested in this guy, Galileo. Then it became really, really interesting. This particular blog, and I actually wrote about this in a chapter, in a book. The students were then starting to question some of the experiments they were doing in their labs and to see if it really followed a logical scientific methodology. Mind you, these are minority students who basically were not honor students, okay? They were, many of them, their advisors were concerned because it's like, you know, your grades in high school and the sciences were not strong. They were really, really, really understanding and reading scientific material. We also did a research article on gambling theory, okay? And there's a great TED talk on this gentleman that does um, probability and gambling. So that was also 
and it was mathematical. So they were reading and engaging in, but again, if you go back to what we were doing, real life connections, developing their academic voice, they were creating a community. By the way, in um, the learning community, the digital learning community, we created a digital lounge where students, if they wanted to, could pop in during the week and one of the mentors, we called the mentors, would be there for two or three hours or an hour and they could stop by and, and, and talk about stuff. The beginning, nothing. First week, second week, third week, all of a sudden, people started showing up. And people started talking to each other. And setting up time outside of the, you know, I really didn't like what you said about the Galileo affair. And you know, I, I don't have time, but you know, can we meet after to talk about this? You know, and then of course, there were college students. So, oh, can we have digital beer here? Someone would put up a digital beer because it's a cafe, you know? So again, but that talked and said to us that they really were connecting. They really were connecting. They would post videos about things in the news that were connecting to their reading. So the cafe also became an informal way to also learn outside of the blogging, okay? I can't help it, I'm a social scientist. One of the things that we did was Plato's Cave. Now, anybody who's taught in higher education knows the students hate Plato's Cave, okay? Because they don't understand it, reading it, okay? So what did we do to get them to be, because one of the things, again, is we said, you know, we want them to be strong scientists, but we want them to be strong thinkers. And we want them to understand that they're citizens in a world. Science just happens to be how they operate in that world, professionally and maybe intellectually. So how did we introduce them to Plato's Cave? When they saw this, they were like, oh God. I read it in high school. I read it in philosophy. You have to do this again? So how did we switch it about? Gotta love YouTube. Before reading it, there's a great clay animation in YouTube about Plato's Cave. They had to see the clay animation. In addition to that, they had to see a clip of the Matrix. Do all of you remember the Matrix? Remember? Keanu Reeves? Do you want the red pill? Or do you want the blue pill? And they had to answer that question. But they had to answer the question within the context of the cave. Because really, the blue or the red pill is about the cave. Do you want the knowledge, the reality, or do you want to live in an artificial world? I have to tell you, I still read the comments from that. I still read the comments from that. Because it was so insightful and how they connected it to the cave and they, some of them connected to the political um, dialogue going on in the country, okay? Some of them connect, connected it to the way they're taught in college. Some of them connected it to religion, to family traditions, when asked, you know, because again, very diverse population, so you had Muslims. Muslim young women, who basically were told, well, that's, that is your culture. That is what you're supposed to ascribe to. And questions of, you know, are we being made to take the red pill, whether we want to or not? So, when you talk about technology and really engaged learning, this was a, a tremendous thing for, for us. And it was an experiment um, because we didn't know what we were gonna get as a result of it. But I have to tell you, the students that participated in the seminar, and there were 40 students who participated in the seminar, we looked at their GPAs compared to other students around same academic makeup and same um, they did 10 to 20% better than their classmates in their classes 
three semesters out afterwards. Um, they stayed in STEM, 40% more than other minority students. Uh, again, not correlational, but did it have an impact? I would, I would think. I, even though I've left that institution, have followed many of those students afterwards, and they still stalk me on Facebook. I have to show you the faces of the students. Um, this is the Friday when we would come together and I would buy pizza or donuts or whatever, okay? Um, at the end, they had to pick one topic, a group. You had to self-select, you had to pick one topic that you were interested in from the blogs and your group had to present on it to the others. So these were the presentations. Some of them resulted in wanting to do research with professors. So the two posters are they did presentations at national conferences. One student um, was just so funny because again, when you create this relationship with students and such, one student is a computer scientist and he really loved the Galileo experiment, you know. And I said to him, you know, there's a professor who's doing research in physics in black holes you should go into this um, experience with him. You should sign up for his internship. And he looks at me and goes, I'll never forget, Dominican young man, Leandro. He looks like Drake, all the girls drove him crazy. Um, he said, did you forget I was a computer science major? You're talking about physics. So long story short, he did go to do this research project. And not only did he go do the research project, he did such a well, a, a good job at it, he developed code to organize the data to collect the information of the black holes. Before he graduated as an undergraduate, he, pup he was an author in two first year physics journals. So when Google went to hire him, guess what they asked? Not about his computer science, they asked about his work in physics. So don't you think he called me up after the interview and he says, Dr. Schreiner made this, Dr. Schreiner, you'll never believe. About what? I just had an interview with Google. I said, well, did you get the job? After all, I'm a Cuban mother. Did you get the job? <laughs> yes. He said, but you know what they asked me about? No. They asked me about the physics. Wow, go figure. And you know I even used the Galileo article. I said, go figure that too. Questions? <laughs> Preguntas, sí, caballero. I have a question uh, on regards of the use oh, of I have to. Now I really am Oprah. On um, regards of the use of technology, like for example, um, students, uh, I, I, I teach a statistics course and a research methods course mm -hmm. in psychology. Mm -hmm. So I have to do whatever it takes to engage them. Mm -hmm. But 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 here, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay. So um, the thing is, when I, uh, I don't know if, if the things of millennials, when I tell them, well, you have to maybe, uh, I, I teach them how to read on a, an academic article. We read the entire article and then mm -hmm. see the parts. And they tend to tell me, oh, I was looking for a paper and I couldn't find it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I always tell them the story of, how my uh, supervisor did the, his dissertation mm -hmm. when there was no internet. Mm -hmm. and, 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 so, <laughs> and they're like, nah, couldn't happen. Exactly. So uh, my question is, how can we incorporate the technology, uh, the mobile devices, without being disruptive mm -hmm. of the, uh, 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 in the learning process? Okay, okay. Because what I've seen, and I don't believe in the millennial thing because I have some issues with that. Mm -hmm. Well, they have a lot of issues. Yeah. It's about me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the thing is that they, what I've seen in the, my students, they, they tend to, I want everything easy. Yep. I want, you know, I, I don't want to. Instant put, gratification. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. How can we manage? So here's, here's the thing. Research doesn't come easy to anybody. No. Everybody. Everybody who did research, 
their doctorate here, please. Come on. Any school. It doesn't come easy. To this day, I still sit. I have an article that's waiting for me to write at home. What do I do in front of the computer? You know? It doesn't come easy. One way to do the how to find the article about, and I did this digitally also, you have to guide students to what questions to ask. So for example, um, I'm a social scientist, so I taught a course on vampires in American culture, okay? So I have them map out the large topic. What's the big thing that you're interested in, okay? And then questions. So I literally create a visual map digitally for them. So what's the big topic? And it's usually, and I, and I always say to them, again, I do social sciences, I said, I'm tired of the death penalty. I don't want to read any more about the death penalty. Okay, I don't want to read any more about you know certain things. So what's the big topic? Okay, so what are questions that you're interested in addressing or finding out about that topic? Okay, so then they have to zero in on that. So which of those questions most interests you? So then let's pull that out, okay? So what are key words that are important, okay, for that question? And then I create a really good partnership with my librarians, okay? And before they go to the library session, I say, these are five general topics that students came up with. These are key words based on the questions that they came up with. Can you go through the search for those topics based on that? So then the information literacy session is geared specifically to their topics of research, the question, the question that they're interested in, and then the key words to look up articles about that topic. Technology is a wonderful thing. They can't leave the session without having at least five research articles, okay? Then their assignment after that is which of those articles even began to address the question that you're thinking about? And they'll learn very quickly four of those articles have nothing to do, even though they look really good. So now they have one article. What are key words in that article? What are references in that article that then you can go and start building to do more research, to get more articles. So even the way that the research begins is almost technologically driven for me. It's a digital um, theme map, okay? And then from that, once they do the articles, they have to have five articles for any paper they do for me. They have to develop an outline a digital outline. What's the, what's the, what is the thesis, working thesis, which changes, might change after the research, right? What are the three or four major topics? What are the subtopics? But this is where I really zero in. You can't put a topic down unless you put in a reference from your articles. How that article is going to help you develop that subtopic. And then I also make them do annotated bibliographies. They hate me. But I have to tell you, by the time they're finished with a course with me, and they do this all digitally, and they have to, by the way, comment on each other's um, thesis statements, outlines, and even their first draft. Because I never have a student do more, never have a student hand in a cold paper to grade. And they have, I use AAC and U rubrics, so written communication rubrics, and infor, the information literacy rubric from AAC and U for their, for their papers. So they know what I'm looking for to begin with. I don't hide anything from them. Does that help a little bit? Other question. I really think about this pedagogy thing. <laughs> Wow, you all must be tired. Yeah. 
It's been a long day. Other questions? Well then, thank you very much. Gracias.